I asked for questions yesterday on Facebook so that I could do a big question and answer video. I'm a bit under the weather and my voice is a little bit rough, but I've got my tea here. So let's see if I can get through all of your questions. Um, I read through them and I gathered some of my equipment around me here. I think they're very neat and look fun to use. I can't say more though because short of a quick shot or two, I've not used them for any length of time. I have a lot of tips in my book. It's called Memberture. You can find it on my site or on Amazon. Snapdrag VIPs can get it for free. If you're looking for the book or are a VIP and want a free copy, just email me at secrets at snapchick.com. I used to shoot weddings quite a bit. It's a great way to make some money and tune your skills under pressure. I don't do them much anymore. Maybe if, you know, a friend twists my arm, I may be a bit too laid back for weddings anymore. I do prefer my Macs, <laughs> although I do have a couple of PCs. I use Aperture 3 primarily, but recently I also subscribed to Lightroom and Photoshop through Adobe subscription service. There's a different answer for every style, but if you send me a link to a look that you're trying to emulate, I'll tell you how I'd do it. Hi Matt, one of my very first viewers. I talk about what I do in these videos. I also use Silver Effects Pro for Aperture 3. You'll get many different opinions on this, so here's mine. Depending on what you're using now, keep shooting with it. For example, I recently worked with this old D50 and the results in practical terms were indistinguishable from my D800. Portraits are one occasion where you have a lot of control. No matter which body I'm using, if I'm shooting portraits and I have the right lens, everything seems to turn out all right. I'm currently testing the Tamron 17-50. It's worked great. I have not used the Sigma though, so I can't make a fair comparison between those two. Um, that's not what you're asking though. I like 35 millimeters and I would happily go anywhere with this little DX lens. I'm pretty easy going and I also like to travel with this 18 to 55 Nikon f3.5 to f5.6. I'd use it in a heartbeat. It's cheap, lightweight, and it gets the job done. That's an easy one. Sunrise. I love getting up early, taking pictures, and having the whole new day ahead of me. My favorite photographer is all of you. The work that many of you post on my Facebook page blows me away. I'm putting a link to my Facebook page in the description of this video so you can check out everyone's amazing work. For sports, the 70-200 f2.8 is the lens that I pick up almost every time. Some people might disagree with me for this, but I shoot bands in manual with auto ISO on. It's usually dark, but I want to hold shutter speed at at least 1 250th if possible, but I don't want to open the aperture super wide and lose focus on areas of the stage. I like 1 250th and f4. This leaves me ISO to control exposure, and it's easy with modern DSLRs to have the camera set that for you. For some people, this is like a sacrilegious way to shoot, but I have the settings I want, I'm focusing on the subject, and I'm not constantly moving command dials around. If I simply don't have enough light, I'll lower the shutter speed a bit. Any prime lens, like this 24 millimeter, 85 millimeter, 105 millimeter, the 50 millimeter that's on the DSLR filming me right now, you get the picture. Anything that I can do in a hurry. I'm not big into post-processing. One or two adjustments and I'm on to the next photo. Most used this month has been the channel mixer as it's been all about monochrome March. You'll get a lot of opinions in this. Full frame sensors help you get wider angles if you're using the same lens on a crop sensor and a full frame sensor. Full frame sensors tend to have better high ISO performance, especially when shooting in low light. That being said, current crop sensor cameras have amazing low light performance. Some people will tell you that full frame sensors have changed their photography dramatically. 
that may be true for them, I guess. But the photos that I've taken that I like are good photos regardless of the camera or sensor that I used. And the bad ones, they're still bad regardless. I'm just as likely to shoot with this crop sensor D300S as I am to shoot with this full frame D800. I wouldn't say that I have one favorite photo that I've taken. There are a few personal family photos that are really just snapshots that stand out in my mind. Since it's monochrome March though, I do particularly like this black and white photo of the Grand Canyon that I took several years back. Camera technology is making this easier and easier with active D-lighting and in-camera HDR modes. Honestly, I'm more likely to shoot it how it looks and then come back later in the day to let Mother Nature make the adjustments near sunset. I most enjoy capturing what I actually see and adjusting my shooting schedule rather than do processing to achieve the, the result that I'm looking for. Everyone has to be careful with this. We do tend to be our own worst critics. I've certainly done this too, but ultimately photography is something to be enjoyed. There's always something to learn. And that doesn't mean that you did it wrong and your work is no good. Embrace what you capture and if you didn't get exactly what you wanted, learn from it and just start planning your next shoot. It never enters my mind really. Every one of your photos, yes, all of yours out there, are like special snowflakes. I'm not the best photographer out there, but I'm always willing to learn and incorporate different aspects of what I see out there in my own photography. And when I come across ways to get better results, I share them with all of you. Not to tell you what to do, but to show you what I like to do. Back to your question though. Comparison is great for learning, but I don't see it as a negative thing, nor do I think that people should beat themselves up by comparing their work to others. Wide aperture lenses, known as fast lenses, are the best way to do this. Prime lenses are the cheapest and arguably the best way to do this. For example, this old 50 millimeter AFD lens sells for a song and is more capable in low light than much more expensive zoom lenses. Location is everything. And when you're shooting indoors, you wanna set things up so you're not shooting in conditions that are too dark. That will make the camera struggle to focus and force you to use ISO settings that are prone to noise or shutter speeds that introduce motion blur either from your subject or from camera shake. I do both methods in my studio. If I could only choose one, I would probably choose strobes. Not true. The crop sensor may cause you to shoot further back from the subject, which will change your depth of field for a given f-stop because you moved back. But f1.8 on a full frame sensor is f1.8 on a crop sensor, period. Because the depth of field changes, people like to say that X lens and aperture on a crop sensor body will give you the equivalent of Y aperture on a full frame body. They're talking only about depth of field though. And as I said, an f1.8 lens on a full frame sensor is allowing the same amount of light into the camera as an f1.8 lens on a crop sensor. If you're not sure about depth of field for a given body and lens combo at a given distance to the subject, there are many depth of field calculators online and for your phone or tablet that will help assure that you get everything you want in focus. That was a great set of questions, guys. Thanks for asking all of them. My voice pretty much held up the entire time too, I think. Uh, I've been averaging about one of these big Q&A videos per month, so be on the lookout for the next call for questions on my Facebook page. But feel free to ask any question anytime on Facebook, Twitter, email, in the comments on YouTube. Talk to you guys later.